Thank you, everyone. And thanks to ABEARS for putting on a great show here. What a great event. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge some of my ABEARS colleagues who are also in this space and in this room, um, because I think there's a few of us in it's a growing area of practice that's really asking this question about the social dimensions of biosecurity and why it matters. Um, and my journey began oh, 15 or 16 years ago when I was asked to think about feral animal management in Northern Australia, um, in Kakadu and surrounding regions. And so for buffalo, pigs, horses, all the usuals. Um, and so some of that then began with a question, which is pretty obvious, I thought, was what is a buffalo? And if you ask that question to some of the traditional owner groups, it's Unabaru, which is a sacred um, animal that has song lines and rock art and special significance. If you ask other mobs too, they say, well, it's also possibly a bit of a resource for our livelihoods and economy. We would like to muster it. For defence, it scares the bejesus out of their army troops as they try and, you know, tackle feral pigs that look like, you know, big, big monsters um, and worried about buffalo in terms of their impacts. And if you ask the conservationists, they're really, really worried about the wetlands. And so that begins our challenge of a little microcosm problem that it wasn't then just asking them, well, OK, what does success look like? So if we actually ask that question of success, all those values and what knowledge people trusted and how they formed those views became essential to what was going to be deemed to be successful. So I want to just take on what Catherine was saying and go the next sort of step on that and then how to think about the science behind social acceptance and unpack that little microcosm into the bigger domains that we've worked in um, to say, and how do we think about that in different operations? I've been really fortunate enough to work with industry and community and government who've been really generous in letting us into their emergency control programs. They've been really um, generous in allowing us into their surveillance and their properties, where we've asked a whole bunch of questions as social and economic scientists to say, so how is this social acceptance going? What is the social and economic impact of this program and of this invasive species? And if there's two things I want you to take from this, one is that a buffalo is not a buffalo. In other words, there's different values and different ways in which that will be framed and that matters. And two, that that buffalo has impact on those values very differently depending on those perspectives. And as a consequence then, how we manage that really matters, okay? So some of that will be that the actual management itself has an impact. So hold your seats, here we go. Page down. All right, so let's unpack what this term is because we're banding it around and maybe some of you aren't as excited about this term as whatever. Um, look, it's just a, it actually comes from the mining industry um, originally, where mining companies realised that they had to have a corporate resp social responsibility in their regions. Um, so there's a bit of thinking there that as they grew up and made lots of money and had a bit of um, social uh, response, positive and negative, that there was a thinking there that actually had to be part of their region. And that's where it began. And so some of that then moved into other domains. And um, of course, we can make a touch base to biosecurity and what that could mean. So, big four points, I suppose, um, from that literature is it's really about acceptance or approval from that local community and other stakeholders who can affect program effectiveness. Big one. So, you know, we really care about that program effectiveness. It matters with that social acceptance. Meaningful partnerships established, which Catherine talked a bit about, between operations, communities and government based on mutual trust. Trust, trust, trust. Um, so some of that about how do you break it, how do you build it, how do you renew it. This whole logic between sets of demands and expectations that are variable between the groups, I'm seeing lots of nods here, um, and that again depends on where that value comes from and what that impact of that invasive pest will be and the management of it. And of course that matching between stakeholders' individual expectations and corporate behaviour and companies' actual behaviour. So managing expectations is a really critical part of that. What can we do? What can't we do? So why does that matter? Well, because under the deed, we have this really great little structure. When you set up your program logic for when you do your um, pests, in, you know, and you set up your debrief and your feasibility study and your economic study and your social impacts sometimes assessment, um, it's very logical. <laughs> and there's lots of rules and regulations about how we declare a pest and how we're going to set up responsibilities for it and how we're going to do deed sharing arrangements with it. And it just looks fabulous. <laughs> and then it hits the ground and local realities go a little muck. Because those values kick in, because the way in which knowledge is trusted or changed or what is deemed credible goes, because we have other avenues where knowledge gets played out, social media, you know, social networks, policy networks. And so why that social licence matters is we've got to bridge that gap between what we hope to achieve through the set rules and behaviours we have to do with biosecurity and what actually happens. 
So let's turn back to that social licence and biosecurity. And of course, we know, as we said at the start, that detecting, diagnosing and responding to biosecurity threats really does require this tricky thing. Community, government and industry having that shared knowledge base, motivation and commitment to their biosecurity responsibilities. This is the essence of shared responsibility. <laughs> and partnerships have been established. Partnerships have been designed. Partnerships have happened um, to do this. Um, and really part of that is to get that agreement between what's the expectation, what's the rules, and how are we going to meet somewhere in the middle um, with a diversity of knowledges and values. Necessary, and as we know, is challenging. Hats off, though, to government agencies and industry groups, which if we think back to that 15 years ago when I was in Northern Territory with, you know, army dudes and kakadoo mob, how different it's gone. So, you know, the journey has been extraordinary. Since the Beale report came out, whenever that was, um, so for me, that like thinking about how much that's moved, we can get a bit depressed about it, but glass half full, um, is, is incredible how much industry has moved, how, many, how much community values have moved. So I think we're getting there. There's a few hot tips perhaps to get us there. So I work at Sorrow, fabulous place to work. Um, and what part of that has been a real commitment to think about social innovation as well as technical innovation. And I do the social science part of that and think about, look, this is not just about technical development and deployment, but we actually have to think about social innovation to get there. Um, so we do a whole bunch of work with that technical expertise that can, say, diagnose those pests or devise really cool methods and think about that social acceptance about how we can deploy them. So we do a lot of work on that science of social acceptance. And that includes things like surveys of community perceptions, behaviours and type of knowledge people use to make decisions. We think about analysis of policy delivery instruments, incentives, regulatory, voluntary and all the rest to improve that response to biosecurity surveillance and emergent programs. It's a great place to work because part of that is being to marry some of that technical expertise that, we, that industry, government and scientists have produced and put that and embed that into some of that social innovation that's needed to get you there. Some of my colleagues would say that's adoption. I think it's a bit broader than that. Um, so some of that was thinking that through. And note I've played around with scale here on that outer circle. We know this plays out at the paddock. We also know this plays out in the supply chain. We know this matters in the government agency community structures that have been, consultative constructions that have been set out there. We know this happens in Canberra between agencies. We know this is part of a big system of governance that happens at all scales of decision making, whether that's federal, state, local and so forth, as well as between scales. When an endemic happens out in a region, we know that this whole system goes off and that this stuff really matters. So I'm going to give you an example of what on earth that means. And I'll just give you a few vignettes of what we've been up to and I'm happy to answer questions later. But there's three kind of areas where we've really enjoyed working in. One's about thinking about that social acceptability of biosecurity programs and why the difference in stakeholders matter. Second thing is about, like, why do they engage or disengage or unengage? So there's a difference there in terms of when you, you know, find out, you know, you hit a program like CARP, why do some get really excited and some just don't care or um, some just are really shying away from it all? And, of course, in trying to understand that full um, impact of biosecurity, and this is where we've really embedded ourselves in some of that programs of the deed, under the deed, um, and thinking through how we can improve things like social impact assessment and feasibility assessment. All right, so give you an example of some of the lovely work that's been going on about this CARP virus. Um, so Catherine's right. Some of that gauging social uh, acceptability matters. And so some of those surveys amongst different stakeholder groups can actually unpack where you have a dad and Dave moment. So when you have that kind of moment of going, so some groups are okay and they trust this bit of it, but actually other groups need a different pathway of acceptability. It's not matching some of the program rules to that acceptability. Where does it matter? It's not just different stakeholders, it's also in different regions. South Australia is different from Victoria. Um, so, you know, some of that whole notion of where that comes from and where place and people matter has become part of that survey's um, results. So we know that some of those contention points, I'll just skip over this because Catherine did a good job on that one, um, disruption of natural ecosystems, we know that some that really pings people um, in terms of where that concern is. There's some about, is about method. Concerns about timely removal of dead fish is the big point of contential, contention. Some of it's taking a bit of a one health approach. Re um, residu residual and long-term human and animal health implications related to the introduction of biocontrol agent. So this is going to set off a whole new of acceptability demands, isn't it? Um, the efficacy of biocontrol agent. 
and of course perceptions of more economically viable alternatives for using um, CARP. So all these things are coming into the melting pot of different options than a particular control option, as well as the CARP itself. So we're back to the buffalo. Um, so in other words, how CARP's being reframed, where it plays in place, and the impacts it could have, and its management, um, have been really explored by Aditi and her team. Secondly, I guess the second area we've really thought through is about this whole engage, disengage and unengage thing. It really matters. So, you know, some get really engaged, more than we'd like sometimes, but some are really engaged, do all the right thing, and, and we know that that's, you know, got a certain capability um, um, signature around it. Some just don't give a rats that's going on. You wish they would, would care. And the ones we're particularly worried about are those that um, start to really un uh, disengage because they've had a past experience. Because we know that biosecurity is going to keep going. Um, we know it may get a little in more intense in some regions. Um, so if we start to get disengagement based on past experiences, we care about this because that could lead to some long systemic concern. So I'll give you an example, back to buffs and pigs. So we've been doing some great uh, work with some of the NARCs, the North Australian Quarantine Service, fantastic program that um, Australian government has um, um, supported, but backs on to a lot of work that Indigenous rangers have been doing across Northern Australia um, and thinking about what does success of that program look like. We've also been working with traditional owner groups up in Cape York, um, and so some of that's been working with pig impacts and, on wetlands, and how can they start to think about viable enterprises around some of that pig control work. Um, some of that work has been also on um, foot and mouth disease discussions about how do we think about pig control in these more remote regions when you've got to rely more on social networks um, rather than perhaps state um, instruments. Part of that's been asking, so how do we evaluate management success when you've got these multiple values? How do we think about this trusted networks in very remote, resource-poor, you know, traditionally resource-poor communities? What do we do with that in these particular contexts? And having to think about how do we bridge in some of these knowledge bases into that? How do we blend, you know, Indigenous knowledge, for example, um, and scientific knowledge to come to the table in that? So there's a whole suite of work there. I'm happy to talk offline about that. Other group of us, Matt and um, us, then started to look at this in the midst of Panama, which was a um, banana disease that has really challenged the northern Queensland industry. We went and just did a whole survey up and down the coast of asking questions about a range of things, including whether you're engaged or disengaged or know anything about this program. And we asked included in that was the community gardens run by local councils. And this showed institutions matter. In other words, we're not an island. Um, part of this, it matters about your institutional makeup and support you're getting. So we asked local councils, regional groups, you know, your local little NGOs and stuff, how much that mattered in terms of whether that was engaged or disengaged. It matters a lot. Um, and th this particularly was this role of councils, which is sometimes a bit of the understudy of um, biosecurity response. And it was fascinating to see the areas where that was high engagement in Panama and really new, even though they're growing bananas in this whole region where it's all going berserk, and where they had absolutely no idea what was going on. <laughs> So for us, we could then start to provide some evidence base by going, look, some are just disengaged. I just don't know what's going on. And part of that was the role of local councils that could play, that we could feed back into those local councils with some suggestions about what to do about it. Last but not least, so we thought about this whole idea about different stakeholders matter. Um, we've thought about this whole issue of disengaged and uh, engaged and unengaged. And I guess there's been a really interesting part of this process, which is about understanding that total um, system health approach um, to biosecurity. I'm really proud that Sora is taking this on because part of this says that biosecurity is stressful. Biosecurity is really stressful. Um, and I think for, for the staff, for the people who are impacted on it, um, and some of the implications of it and how we can think about that support service with a bit more um, total system health approach to it. So we've had actually a bit of internal thinking about that total system health to bring health to the table. It's early days, but I'm pretty excited about it because it says that mental stress and mental wellbeing is actually a key feature of biosecurity that we haven't thought about. I was really, really um, amazed that we got into all those growers with the banana industry um, that were you know, being hit by that Panama and they let us survey them during that time. And when you see grown men whose hands look like bananas, um, you know, crying, it's pretty, pretty full on, 
You know, it's a pretty stressful existence. And when they talk about how, in fact, while they should have huge social networks around them to support them, actually the social networks collapse. No one wants to go on their farm. Their kids can't, don't get talked to at school. The time, you know, all, well, I'm seeing all the nods, right? So some of this is about how do we think about some of that social, social health and wellbeing factors in our biosecurity program. This is the next area that I really am pushing forward. Um, to say how do we bring in some of that health component. So really keen to talk to those who think this is um, the, the, some stuff we go. But of course we should provide some evidence there. So we went and surveyed them and thank you to um, Sora for giving some internal money just to go and ask. And we basically did a... Um, so, we, so we've got some great psychologists in, in Sora who um, asked about stress. And we surveyed not only landholders but community members all in that Panama affected area and asked them about levels of stress and what they were stressed about. It was huge. 50% of northern farm owners reported that Panama was highly personable stress and a high stress, less, um, stress threshold. In other words, it was actually causing them serious stress and bouts of depression. Significant proportion of local residents reported Panama as not at all stressful. So this was the other end of it, that even though they should perhaps be a little stressed about it, didn't know. So equally so, those who aren't stressed about it can actually give you some um, pinpoints about where that engagement was. So we took that back to Queensland Health and started to say, well, you know, the Tully Support Group and all those other mechanisms actually really need to be embedded into the biosecurity program and how do we think about connecting the health and biosecurity aspects to that and hats off to some of those um, aspects of that to make some of those connections. But I think we could probably do a bit more. So in sum, I guess um, it's great, this area, and I'm really... Um, enjoying biosecurity um, areas and domains because it really is that high end, uh, end of risk and risk assessment and risk management. Um, but thinking about that through people and partnerships is what some of the stuff that we've brought some evidence to the table. Two things in terms of impact. I think it helps reduce the likelihood of biosecurity breaches and to minimise the impact should they arise. So I think if we can get people ready for that um, moment, we can actually reduce that breaching area and, of course, minimise impacts, including social impact, um, as part of that process. So thinking about that in terms of debriefing and feasibility assessments and all the parts of that surveillance and emergency response program. And, of course, I'll add this in, to enhance health, social, environmental and economic wellbeing in the face of increased global biosecurity threats. We know this is important. We know that we've got this, you know, fabulous ideas and um, strategies involved in terms of agricultural production and development. Some of this de-risking that biosecurity can bring to the table, I think it's got some great um, uh, aspects to bear. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.